Oh, yeah, there it does. <clears throat> and go. Oh, no. Yeah. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither PhilStockWorld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective officers, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment security or transaction. Trading options involve risk. Visit the OCC website, www.optionsclearing.com, to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options. And we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any losses you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. There you go. All right, so what's up, guys? So, I'm going to do the more dramatic reading this week because I went to see uh, Shakespeare in the Park in New York City. I wonder if they got a picture of it. Uh, much? I do about nothing. Central Park. It was great. I got to tell you. Where's the picture? Yep, there it is. Okay. Oh, that's an older one. That's not the one I just saw. They, they did much more. Uh, oh, is that it? That's it. That's that's the cast I just saw. It. So anyway, so they they built this whole house. They see in the old production they had a set. They just had a, a facade, but now they just built a whole house, which was interesting because you're sitting all around them, which you can see better on here. You're sitting like pretty much all around. So now the stage has just a house in the middle and, the, and all the action was taking place around the house and all the things of the house and whatever. It was very good. It was really tremendously good. And, uh, and a wonderful way to watch a show. Um, it was so cool. And then we sat right like on this side, but we sat like right there in the front row. It was so cool. So highly recommended sort of thing to do is go to Shakespeare in the Park in New York City if you can. It's very hard to get tickets. I do have a guy, if you have him on him, I know a guy who can get tickets for it. And um, it was phenomenal though. Very cool thing. Anyway, other than that, that was like the only fun thing I did in New York. Everything, everything else I did in New York with business dinners. Uh, the good thing about New York though is I can handle the germs up there. So when I take a trip to New York, I don't get sick. Last time I got back from California, their, their weird international germs got me sick. I guess New York has international germs too, but I, mean, I seem to be able to handle those. Not sure why, but California came back. I was so sick. I couldn't talk for two weeks. Anyway, all right, so what else is going on? Market stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. We did that, we did that, we did that. Let's take a look at what the indexes look like at the moment. We are, well, we're going along. I mean, the Russell is red, which has got to, I mean, you've got to start getting concerned about this. Why is the Russell down and down and down and won't come back even now? <laughs> I just have a splinter on my desk. All right. Wow. Didn't know that would happen. Um, so the Russell's going down and down and down. Uh, the dollar, where's the dollar? There's a dollar. The dollar is still pretty weak. Now, Russell companies like a stronger dollar. They don't like a weak dollar because they're, they're generally U.S. companies. They get paid in dollars. And uh, it doesn't really benefit them to have a weak dollar. Uh, it's better for them to get the strong dollars. 
they buy this stuff. Think of it all a store that buys all their crap from China, so strong dollar helps them, and then they sell it for US dollars. So they, what do they want? They want a strong dollar, right? Um, so, so the small cap companies tend to be people who want uh, the stronger dollar. That's why the Russell can sometimes diverge like that. But it's a warning sign. I mean, that's this is as I was saying this morning in the post. This is most companies. The NYSE is most companies. This is not most companies. This is a very small selection of of companies. It's not telling you the full picture. The Nasdaq, we the NQ is the one hundred. I think. Pretty sure, yeah. NQ is the 100, but there's no the composite is very misleading. It may have 2,000 stocks in it, but the way the way it's weighted is that the other um, the the bottom 1,990 stocks don't matter. It's Apple and the Fang stock. Well, Apple is a Fang stock. Apple and the other Fang stocks, and that's it. There's the, it doesn't matter what the other companies do. So you can't tell anything from that index too. The the Russell is particularly cut off by market cap and is equally rated throughout. So in other words, all the companies have an equal sort of rating by market cap. They're all, but since the market cap is cut off at a low number, no company has a major outsized influence in the Russell. That's not true of any of the other indexes except the NYSE, which is also a cap weighted index, but, but the NYSE includes the mega caps. So he, even that has a little bit more of a, um, a favoritism towards high performing companies than the Russell. So the Russell is really the most honest assessment of what's going on right this minute in the market. Okay, it's like the pulse versus the, the blood pressure. It'll change, you know, on a regular basis, and you can see quickly what's going on in the market by watching the Russell, and then you assume if the Russell is setting up a serious trend like this downtrend that's been going on for a week, right? Because this is see, I don't know if you can see it. This is 6:20, and here's 6:26. So this is a week's worth of trading every day. Down, 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 and down, and today down, and probably will finish down here. Now, if that's the case, this is not good. Okay, <laughs> I don't have any other way to put it. It's more than two, a two and a half percent drop. <clears throat> if we look at 1580 as being the line, okay, times 0.975, so 1540 was the 2.5% line. That didn't hold up. So another 40 points down is going to be 1,500 is going to be the 5% line. So that can get pretty ugly, all right? And the other guys have not had a correction that big yet, so we're waiting to see what happens. But these guys have plowed through 1,540, failed to take it back, and are now looking at 15, uh, 1,500, and, and obviously, if you have an 80-point drop to 1,500, then you're looking at 16-point bounces, 20% of the drop, so the weak bounce is going to be at 16, and the strong bounce is going to be right here. Look what happened here, 32. That's a strong bounce line. So you see how you had a little bit of consolidation at the strong bounce line? When you see that, it's an indication that 1500 must be in play. Otherwise, why would why would 1500 strong bounce line come into play if 1500 wasn't in play already? So by by seeing this sort of action at, at the strong bounce of the 5% drop, you got to figure we're probably on the way to that 5% drop, especially if the weak bounce line fails and the weak bounce line is 16. So 15, 16 over here is the weak bounce line. So far, it's held up. But that's the critical number. If that if that fails, then we're totally heading down to fifteen hundred. And if that's the case, and and, and you know, frankly, I mean, anything under fifteen thirty two, I would be extremely cautious. But that means you can then start calculating on the other indexes and say, well, they should all be down there two point five percent lines at least. So now we're starting to get a clue on the market as to what's going to happen, and we like to know what's going to happen, right? So we take the five day charts. And now we figure out our consolidation zone. So on the Dow, that's easy. And we're looking at the Dow is uh, 26.8 times 0.975. So the 2.5% line from the Dow is 26.130, which, wow, way down here. That's ugly. But you can even see there was consolidation action there already. So, we, you know, that's obviously an alignment in play. 
So 26,130 is what we'd be looking for in the Dow. That's going to fall, again, not necessarily, but if it falls, it's going to fall uh, 500 points. All right, and 500 points on the Dow is 2,500 bucks. This is what I look at when I'm doing the futures. So I can make 2,500 on the Dow on a 2.5% correction from where it is now on the S&P 2,960 times point. Ah. 2,960 times point 0.975 is 2,886. That's down here. And that is um, 40 points down. And that's only 800 bucks on the S&P. No, no, sorry, 40 points is 2,000 bucks. I apologize. $50 per, per um, point on the S&P. So 40 points is $2,000 for the drop on the S&P. And again, does that line make sense? What's 2,886? Here it is. And look what happened over here. It was a consolidation line. So it, it just adds to the validity of that line. And then we look at the NASDAQ. And here we're going to call it. And here, the, the, again, the, the thing about the 5% rule, I know it bothers a lot of people. My daughter is one of those people who's very, uh, my, my younger daughter, Jackie, likes everything has to be the way it is. Like she likes, she's a baker. Bakers are like that. They're exact. You know, like people like baking, like things to be exactly and like measuring stuff and whatever. So with Jackie, I always have to be like, you know, she wants to see specifically what's what something is. So if I tell her that you look at the uh the top of the of the NASDAQ, she will she she says it's not 7,800, it's 7825. But that's you have to you, you know, there's an art to this. You have to throw it out, you have to look for yourself and figure out where the consolidation was. Where did we really top out on the NASDAQ? And it was 7,800. No, I wouldn't count 7,825. That's the art of the 5% rule. And, there, and, and I understand that there's a lot of people who are like Jackie who don't like that. They like things to be, it's exactly what number it did. That's not where it stopped. You have to just use your own head and look at the consolidation lines. So we got 7,800 here. And then we punch that in. So we have 7,800 times point. 9.75, two and a half percent drop, goes to 7,600. Well, we already did that. <laughs> oh no, it was, it was 78, yeah, it was 78. So 78 times point 9.75. So 200 points is a two and a half percent drop on the NASDAQ. That means, now logically, since we've already basically hit that, that means um, that, the, that probably the next line in play is gonna be 7,400. So we have, a, we have a definite chance of the NASDAQ plunging 7,400. 7,600 is 80 points times 20 bucks a point on the NASDAQ is 1,600. But with the NASDAQ, there's a possibility that we actually drop another 200 points, which is 4,000 per contract. That makes the NASDAQ futures a bit appealing. But, and, 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 and there's a big but, I wouldn't play the NASDAQ short unless I felt there was some reason Apple was going to fall. And Apple might fall on the, if the G20 doesn't go well, then Apple is going to start having a bit of headwinds and things are going to get a little tense. Um, it's possible we come out of the G20, and this is a worst case thing, not probable, but it's possible we come out of the G20 and China says, I can't work with this jackass, we're imposing tariffs on Apple. That could easily happen. You know, there, there's a lot of things that can go. They can, China can start playing games with lithium and Apple would plunge. Not lithium, I'm sorry, for, with rare earths. I don't know why I thought of lithium. Um, China can start messing around with the rare earth supply and that can plunge Apple because they can't really, they can't actually make any phones without Chinese rare earth. They can't make it. That's why you say they, they talk about movie production out of China and stuff like that. It's like, you, you know, China is only being nice to Apple because they employ like, I, I think it was 30, I think it's 30 million. I think Apple, not directly, but you know, through their subsidiaries in China, through uh, Foxconn and everything, they employ 30 million people in China. I, it doesn't matter how big your country is, you can't ignore someone who employs 30 million people. You know, so on the one hand, I don't think China is likely to really attack Apple too hard, but on the other hand, they're the ultimate leverage because China's totally gotten by the balls. 
And Apple can say, oh, we're going to start moving some of our production to Vietnam and this and that. But realistically, it is not that hard to hire. It's not that easy to build factories and hire and train 30 million or, or one, let's say they move a third, 10 million people. Okay, the entire population of Vietnam, I'm surprised, I don't think is 20 million. Um, Viet. I am a compulsive fact checker, by the way. Viet. Oh, it's hard for me to say something without making sure I got it right. Vietnam uh, population. What? <laughs> I just banged that off by a mile. Holy crap. They are just packing them in there. I had no idea. I didn't, never knew that. I thought I never thought Vietnam was that large. Holy cow. Okay, well, maybe you can't find million people in Vietnam still. Even in a hundred million population, though, it's a big, it's a it's a it's a, a lot of work. And um, they gotta be careful about that. What chart were we looking at? I forgot. <clears throat> oh, NASDAQ, right. So uh so anyway, so you, have, you know, and, and that's the thing. A lot of statements get made and the market moves on these rumors where somebody says this and somebody says that, but nobody really thinks, you know, you've got to look ahead and think like, well, if they say they're going to do that, how are they going to actually execute that? And that's one of the things you want to do. So I was just thinking there's no way in Vietnam you're going to get to, to 10 million people, but yeah, you can apparently. Apparently you can move 10 million jobs to Vietnam, although it's doubtful that they've got 10 million people sitting around doing nothing. Um, they could have 10% unemployment though, and it's doubtful that all 10% of those people, even if they were unemployed, would all have the skills necessary to go and assemble iPhones and so on and so forth. Plus, obviously, there's no factories, you know, things like that. Um, it's, you know, it's not like it's easy to build a, uh, a completely clean environment factory overnight. You need experienced people in the, on the, you need people who have experience on the construction end first. It has to be built right or it's useless. If you can't create a completely clean environment and bring the workers in and have them completely sterile when they enter the place, the whole thing is off anyway. It's not going to work. So you have to start with that. Then you have to train the workers and the supervisors and the managers and everybody else has to be up to speed on making sure this process goes correctly. All the intakes have to be done through clean rooms and, and certain ways. And it's, you know, it, it's a logistical nightmare. And, and Foxconn took decades to build up to that kind of volume. It's not like you can just walk, you know, you can't flick a switch and move your production. It's just not even conceivable. So, you know, it's not, so these are, a lot of these things are empty threats when you hear them. But Apple is very, very dependent on China, and so are a lot of companies. But that's because we've had really good relations with China for, for decades now. You know, we've had great relations with China. You know, China, you say, well, we shouldn't have because they do a few bad things. But, you know, you, you have to, this is what Trump doesn't get. You have to trade with people who do bad things. You just have to try to leverage your trading as best you can. But you can't not trade with them. You can't just say, I'm not going to trade with you when, when they're the world's second largest economy. That's madness. Even if we weren't all tied at the hip, but we are tied at the hip with China. We, we depend super heavily on them for manufacturing. So, you know, that's, that's a, it's still a very, very big concern. Anyway, so the NASDAQ would not be my favorite thing to short, and we just looked at the Russell for the other Russell. Um, the Nikkei is already down, obviously getting back to its lows. Uh, the Euro stocks are basically in the same position as the S&P. So everybody's making these half half-assed moves down, but nobody's making a contrary move. I, we didn't pick any of these indexes and go, oh no, that one's in great shape. They're all getting weak. They're all consistently trading down into the G20 meeting and despite the Fed. That's the environment we gotta be looking at right now. Okay, this is not this is not very safe. So you gotta be really careful about this stuff. Okay, Matt says Foxconn has 1.3 million workers in China. Yeah, but it's not just Foxconn. I mean, it's, it's Apple. I, I mean, I can show you. There's a there's a number of it. But they say all the jobs that Apple has, you know, Apple-related jobs in China 
which you know means all the suppliers and all these different people at all these various companies, not just Foxconn, I guess the, the leading example. Apple Jobs in China, hopefully it doesn't show me Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> Apple supports 4.8 million jobs in China. Well, that's not much. Supports 5 million jobs in China. Where do they get 30 million? Maybe I'm wrong. 4.8 million, 4.8 million. Well, I could have been wrong about 30 million. Ah, I swear I read that just a while ago. All right, well, okay, five or six million is, uh, but let's call it five million then. So that means they easily, they, that means they can move it to, to uh, the end of It's just going to take them time to build it and do stuff. But they want to move a third of those jobs out, they can. There you go. Apple claims it has created and supported 4.8 million. Yeah, not 30 million. I don't know where I got that number. That's just way off. Okay. Oh, but then on the other hand, then that means that it's more likely China would be willing to screw them. Because I thought they, I thought for 30 million jobs, they'd never screw them. For four, you know, for 4.8 million jobs, uh, if China thinks Trump uh, is going to cost them more jobs, <laughs> as Mariota says, LOL on stats today, Phil. We are still the best. Well, I'm sorry. I just got back from vacation. Not vacation, but I got back from trip. And uh, no, I don't know why I have that number in my head. I really don't. It's uh, just for some reason, I really have that stuck in my head, and I thought it was a total fact. Anyhow, um, that's why I like to check things up. I always want to know before I actually commit to something. Uh, and you shouldn't. That's the same thing when you make an investment. You got to check every number to make sure that that the things you that you're hearing are true. The reporters get it wrong too. You know, a lot of times I, I read an article and I go check it to find out the guy was wrong. Um, and I can be wrong too. So always check me and tell me if I sound like an idiot because I I, I would rather know. <laughs> so where were we? Um, Jobs, China, Apple. Yes, screwing Apple. Right. So okay. So now, now the plot thickens then, because if, if Apple only has 5 million jobs in China and they're threatening, which from China's point of view is a threat, you know, they, they, they may be sensibly moving them, but that's still, it's a threat. You're threatening to take a million jobs away from China. So China looks at Apple and says to themselves, hmm, so Apple wants to take away a million jobs from China to make Trump happy. And obviously other companies are going to feel the pressure to do that as well. So we're going to start losing serious amounts of jobs to Vietnam and other countries. And they are tariffing the crap out of our factories and giving us a huge disadvantage in trade. Therefore, we strike back. And where do you strike back? We'll strike back at Apple too then. Apple's not doing China any favors. Apple's not saying we're going to stand, stand behind you guys in this thing. They are doing it with, uh, with Huawei. But, um, you know, not just Apple, but all the, all the companies that are kind of banding around Hawaii and saying, you know, God, you know, you, the U.S. government can't do this to a company. You can't take out a company without any actual evidence based on innuendo and say that we're not, you know, we're not, not only are we not going to do business with you, the U.S. government, we're not going to allow anybody in the country to do business with you. And we're going to go around petitioning all of our allies to stop doing business with you. And once they didn't get the blowback from Hawaii, uh, the Americans just started with a few more Chinese companies. The same bullshit. All right. Now, you could say maybe it's not bullshit. Maybe they are all spying on you, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, do you believe that, you know, Apple and Dell and HP and all the companies who put these components in their systems are such morons that they buy these boards and these, and these components from Hawaii and they have no idea that they have spyware in them? Do you really think our tech companies are that stupid? Do you think they don't check? Do you think they don't make sure that the stuff going their computers is, poor, is pure because it reflects poorly on them? They're not going to put in parts into their computer that, that have malware in it and then have thousands, millions of people get affected because it ruins their reputation. 
so they're not going to put up with it. So it's, it's not very likely that Huawei, who's a company that likes to make money, just like any other company, is going to sit there and make and, and just put out all everything being evil spyware. And again, our government, for all their accusations, has had no proof whatsoever. There is no Huawei board with a with a bug in it, with a subroutine that's stealing data. There's no such thing. It's never been shown to anybody. And everybody's at this point. Everybody certainly looked. Every obviously everybody running a server after Trump's guys came out and said that about six months ago. Every single company that has a server that has way products in it has been checking their their freaking servers, making sure. No company wants an open line. It, it doesn't matter who the government is. If it was Canada, they wouldn't. If, you know, you don't want Canada spying on your business either. It doesn't matter who it is. Certainly not China. All this is just bullshit that they're telling you to make China the, the, the bogeyman, which is in, insane. And, and, the, and the reality is that China is catching up to us in technology. Um, do they do it by stealing technology and things from the, from the technological partners? Yes, they do. That's one of the bad things China does do, is they, they will... Uh, first of all, they, they blatantly steal patents. They, they take things in court, but everybody does this, you know, I mean, in business. It's just in China, the business is the state, but everybody, every company takes a competitor's product and tears it down. You know, when, whenever an iPhone comes out, they have a, it's a, it's a whole fun, fun thing to tear it apart and look at where everything comes from, how it's assembled, what's in it, and so on and so forth. That's, what are you doing? You're stealing their IP when you do that. You're saying, here, yeah, here's how you can make your own iPhone. Take all these parts. That is stealing technology. Now, there's patents in technology also, and they, and they steal that. But you know what? Patents are filed at the U.S. Patent Office. Okay, our issue with China is really an issue of patent protection more so than anything else. It's like when somebody has a patent on something, it's filed at the Patent Office. You can go steal it. It just gives them the right to sue in court. The problem we have with trade with China is mostly that we don't have a very good ability to have a neutral court system where we can enforce technological trademarks. And, I, you know, I got to tell you, though, on the other hand, though, it's if we do have it, then how many companies are going to spend forever in court? Look at Apple and Qualcomm. They've been in court for like four years, and, and they're only just settling pieces of it now. It's really insane. And, 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 and there you go, it's the same thing, right? Qualcomm is like, hey, Apple stole our stuff, blah, blah, blah. They were, they were our partners, and then they took our stuff, and now they made their own, and now you know, that's what this is all about. So, you know, it's not just China. This is just how businesses operate. So you can't vilify China for doing what other businesses do. It's just the businesses in China are controlled by the state. Therefore, you point your finger at the state. Um, and, and by the way, not that our businesses aren't the state. I mean, you know, is Lockheed Martin not a state-run company? Is, is Raytheon not a state-run company? Do they not sit there with our top military people and our top intelligence people discussing their programs in development, their software in development? Do they not share information with the government? Of course they do. It's the whole point. But just like I share information with my customers when I'm doing something, just like any company is going to share information with their top customers and whatever. That's how it works. In China, it's a little more blatant because the state owns a percentage of the company rather than it just being a private company that sits down and acts like the, the government owns it. But, you know, in any business, you know this, that your biggest customer owns you. You know, effectively, your biggest customer pretty much owns you, especially when they're like half your business. You know, you're not really going to make a move without it. You know, without big customers, when we would make a change in the in stuff that we were doing in my companies, uh, you used to only big customers first say, you know, we're planning on doing this. How do you guys feel about that? Do you have, are you happy? Do you have an opinion on this? Is it something you like or don't like? I don't want to make, do something my biggest customers don't like. You know, I mean, you can have a different color of car and they just, if they don't like pink, they just don't buy pink. That's not going to affect them. But if you redesign the dashboard, you better tell them how you're redesigning the dashboard because they want to know. 
they're like, oh, your, your dashboard won't look like it used to look anymore, or you're going to have different tires than you used to have, or you're changing the engine block, or you're making the, uh, you're putting the gas cap on the other side. You don't think that's a good idea because most of our customers are, are like, like this side, like the right side, not the left side. Who cares what it is? The point is, you don't piss off your biggest customers. So, they, so whether or not they own the company, they still have a say in what you do. But, but then to turn around and just because of some cozy relationships, I mean, if, you know, China should never buy anything from Boeing, Raytheon, or, or, or Lockheed Martin for the same reason. They're too, they're too cozy with the government, so we can tell. You know, and it's, it, it's, there's government programs where they buy all this stuff. You know, IBM works directly with the CIA, developing programs and computers and systems and so on and so forth. Should we, should, should no other country ever do business with them? That doesn't mean, you know, it's not how it works. The way it works is to build relationships with trading partners and, and make it so that, you know, rules are enforced and there's, there's somewhat of a semblance of a, of a, of a disconnect or what they call the Chinese wall, in fact. <laughs> Which is funny, that's the name of it. But it's, uh, so, you know, when, 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 when you purposely don't share information within your own company to make sure there are no conflicts of interest, that's called a Chinese wall. And uh, <laughs> so we accuse China of not having the, the Chinese wall when, when it's sort of their thing. So anyway. So that's, I mean, that is by far the biggest overhang we have. And, and, and everybody's sort of enthusiastic that we're coming into the G20. And, uh, you know, obviously, well, it's possible that Trump and Z are going to stage a great big hug out at the G20 and quickly come to a deal or even, or even have a, an outline of a deal that they sign and show how fabulous they both are as leaders for working out the differences. It's possible they'll stage something like that. It's not completely impossible. In, if, they're, if they do that, though, it's because they've just been stringing everybody along and, and all this has been bullshit, you know, because obviously all that would have been done behind the scenes earlier. Um, if you take them at their word that what's been going on, all this up and down trade stuff is real, then they don't have an agreement coming into the G20. All they could possibly do this weekend is agree to talk. That process will take a month, two months, three months, whatever, even no matter how much they want to get it done quickly. Um, and we're going to almost uh, head into the end of the year without ratifying a deal because uh, it still has to go past Congress and everything. So, so what is everybody so excited about? What can possibly happen tomorrow? It's the same thing with the Fed, too. There's no indication from the Fed they're going to cut rates in July unless the economy is worse. Now, if Trump wants the Fed to cut rates, he needs to make the economy worse, which means he needs to not make a deal with China this weekend. But if, he, if Trump does make a deal with China this weekend, then there's no way the Fed's going to cut rates. No way will the Fed cut rates if we have a deal with China. That's the reason they're cutting rates. Or considering cutting rates is because they're like, well, this trade thing with China can destroy the planet Earth. So <laughs> that would be a good reason to cut rates and make sure we have a, a more robust economy to cushion the blow. So there are no particular positive outcomes this weekend. And like I said, the NASDAQ makes a very good potential short. And as and we already have, we have the SQQQs and the Dow, we added the DXDs. Um, that's what we're looking at. All right, so Ryan reminds me that we were supposed to look at the EIA report, and that is, where is it? EIA. This is an old one, June 7th. We refresh, and hopefully, magically, June 21st. Yay. Okay, so we had a hell of a draw. Um, Oil decreased by 12 million barrels. Uh, gasoline decreased by a million barrels. Distillates down by 2 million barrels. That's a massive, massive drop. Um, that, it sounds like 12.8, uh, 13.8, 14.15.8, uh, 16.2 million barrels. And in fact, 
49, 50, 61, there's about 12 million is actually reflected. All other oils, <laughs> all, all other oils had a massive build. Oh, that's funny. All other oils, we have 51 here and 78 here. That's a 27 million barrel build. Wow. Something's weird here. The, the SPR didn't change. All other oils are up by 27 million barrels, which is a massive, massive build. Distillates are down by 2 million barrels, 2.4, which is what it says. Motor gasoline is, is down a million, what it says. And crude oil is down by 12.8. And, and, and the totals are 12.8-ish. But look at this. This doesn't make sense. And this goes back to that math problem we always have over here, right? There's something really weird going on, guys. This build completely offsets the loss. But then when you add those up, if we add up 469 plus 230, oh, come on, what? I'm below. 469 plus 233, I'm adding because of the decimals, uh, plus 125 plus 478 plus 6, what's that, 6, 645. 1950, that's correct. And then we do 482 plus 233 plus 128 plus 452 plus 6, yeah, 645, 1940. Ah, remember we had those discrepancies? So the discrepancies are no, this, this is so suspicious. <laughs> I cannot believe how suspicious this all is. So when we had those massive builds, we had those discrepancies where these don't really add up, where this total of 1960, yeah, calculate it. This total of 1960 is really 1940 if you add those columns up, right? But all of a sudden, so we were, we were showing 20 million more barrels than there actually were. Now, in order to show you a draw right before the July 4th holiday, all of a sudden, the 20 million extra barrels have disappeared. And remember, this was bothering me for like a month that I kept seeing this column wasn't adding up correctly, and it kept not adding up correctly, and we kept coming up with theories of why would the column not work, and we were talking about this little indentation here, one that says dissolute fuel in the Northeast Heating Reserve and not included, but not included doesn't mean, you know, I, it, you know, we, we were just excusing it by saying it doesn't mean not included here. Now suddenly it's included though, because now it adds up exactly. These numbers add up exactly to that number now. Last, last week, these numbers added up to 1940, but it showed 1961. It showed more oil than there actually was. So now when you take away the extra 20 million barrels and you hide the 20 million barrels in all other oils and don't report that bill because the EIE doesn't report all other oils, they only report on oil, gasoline, distillate. So when you when you ignore a 27 million, 26 million barrel build and you and you fudge the math, you give the impression of a massive drawdown right in time to jack up the prices right ahead of the holiday weekend. This is just major, major bullshit, guys. There's something really weird going on. It's not normal. And I, and I, I apologize for not having the uh, time or inclination. I call, and I, I call Steve Zwerin, he's a Z-man. Um, 
and I talked to him about it. He said, well, it's their knockout on the pad and this and that and whatever. And I'm like, I don't think so, dude. And, I, and I'm back to, I don't think so, dude. Because uh, something's wrong here. These numbers are being manipulated and they're, and they're just being, they're just, you know, we're, the people are being tugged around. They manipulated a massive sell-off in the oil by fudging the numbers. Then I'm sure people made billions of dollars doing this. And, then, and again, if you have, if there's corruption in the EIA, if you've got the right government people in place who are willing to take bribes or whatever, you can do this because they can make billions of dollars going down by fudging the numbers. They can make billions of dollars going up by fudging the numbers, by unfudging the numbers. And you're only going to get caught if somebody in the government bothers investigating, and this is not the kind of government that's going to invest that kind of thing, investigate that kind of thing. And, and meanwhile, it's screwed like so many other investors get screwed by this sort of thing. But it's mad. I mean, we, you know, we've been doing the math for weeks. This is the first time it's actually added up in that column, except now it's very suspicious that it adds up in the week that we show this insane um, drawing group. Now, meanwhile, let's think about this. <clears throat> You know, for you know, first of all, plus or minus some, some barrels is not a big deal. We we consume more or less 140 million barrels a week. I'm sorry, a day. A, uh, I'm sorry, a week. Yeah, a week. The 140 million barrels a week of oil is consumed. So plus or minus 1.4 million barrels is one percent. So that's never going to be a thing. 1.4 million barrels is is normal variation. But when you say 12 million, 14 million barrels. That is 10% change in demand in a week. Now, was it a holiday week? No. It was a nothing ordinary kind of week. Why would U.S. drivers all of a sudden use 10% more fuel? What changed? Nothing changed. That's what's weird about this, huh? What is going on? There's something strange because there's not that much variation in such a large group. And, and it's consistent because we made 20.2 million barrels last year. We made 20.7 last, last week. We made 20.5 this week. So the production is the same. There's no changing the production. It's, it's almost invariable. The prices are really changing. Well, last year we were paying 69. Now we're paying 57. Last week, 52. And that was above the lows. Same thing for gasoline, two bucks last year, and it was 170 last week. Now it's 184, it's 190 something now. It's like 196 now. 196 from 170. That's that's basically a 20% gain in, in a week. That's pretty crazy. Or really two weeks. So, you know, but I mean, what is going on here? You know, we are we are being lied to. It's very obvious that we're being lied to. <laughs> um, wow. Anyway, um, and petroleum products, the exports are they're not as bad as last year, but they're ramping up again. Another so we were at 650 last week exporting. We're now exporting 869. So that's 200 more. That's 1.4 million barrels a week more. It adds up pretty fast, right? 1.4 million barrels more are being exported this week than last week. Um, and at the same time, we're importing a million less barrels. So that's 2 point, um, whatever, 2.4 million barrels of swing just on the import-export numbers. So a lot of stuff is hitting at the same time here that's moving the inventory. So that indicates again. Now, you can't go against it because this is a pre-holiday thing plus the OPEC's coming up. And we knew all this was going to happen. That's why we were long on gasoline and oil. We knew this was going to happen. We knew it was going to be a fake bottom. We knew it was going to go back up into the July 4th holiday. The question is, what do we do after July 4th? And the answer seems to be, this is all bullshit. So it's going to be a short again. All right, so come July 4th, we, we right now we should be rooting for it to go as high as possible because the higher it goes, the more fun we're going to have shorting it. It's really crazy though. I've never seen such in, I've never seen such incredible discrepancies in numbers like this. 
Brian says, everything burned in the Philadelphia fire. Well, yes and no, because here's your gasoline inventories. I mean, that's a, it's a factual number, but gasoline inventories. Something burned, but honestly, refinery fire, um, they don't, um, I don't think it's even possible to see this. One million barrels of oil. Okay. Let's see if there's a picture of such a thing. I, I don't think there can be. I don't see what. Let's take a look at what it's going to look like. I want you to get an idea of what we're talking about. Well, that's not really telling us anything, is it? Anyway, this is what oil storage does look like. And even here, okay, so these are these are the, the, these are barrels, and you've got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then God knows how many. I mean, it's quite a lot though. Uh, so it's eight times two is sixteen, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, hundred. Let's call it a hundred. So let's say this is two hundred barrels right here. The hundred by oh no I'm sorry it's a hundred rows times um, we said sixteen per so it's sixteen hundred yeah that's great sixteen so this is sixteen hundred in this section here all right just for a rough estimate so if you would say this is um one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen 14, 15, 16, okay, 16. So here's 16 times 1600. Six, well, 16 times 1600. So here's 25,000 barrels. What? Yeah, that's right, okay. So in this picture are 25,000 barrels of oil at a refinery, and it's stretching pretty damn far, right? You're talking a million barrels. So enough to move the needle on inventory in the United States. So a million divided by 25,000 is 40. You need 40 times more than this, than what you can see here, 40 times that much. So, you know, visually, You're just not really going to, it's not going to be encompassed in something you're going to be able to see. You know, these are massive storage facilities. These guys are doing a good job of stacking it up somewhere. But, to, you know, you, so you, you're looking at, uh, that's got to be a couple of acres. So you'd be looking at, um, you know, something like 100 acres worth of oil, you know, stacked up like that. Um, in other words, this thing blowing up would have only it, it it can't take out more oil than you can fit around the facility even if it all got consumed so even if it were a million barrels even if it were two million barrels it wouldn't cause this kind of uh, a movement in oil so so you know it's like it's it sounds good to say oh yeah the refinery fire that's what causes but it's not realistic. It did. It could not have burned that much. I believe it was a. I believe the capacity of that refinery was three fifty a day. Um, and there were two reactors and only one blew up, two, two, uh, you know, refined things. And, um, you know, it was huge and, and terrible. It was like these things blew up and the, and the, and the actual machinery inside blew up. Um, and probably some of the oil that was in loading docks and so on and so forth around the pads blew up. Not good. I mean, certainly, certainly a lot of damage is done, but not enough to affect the entire country's supply of oil you know because all they can hold here even if they have 30 acres 40 i'm sorry even if they have 100 acres like this all they can hold here is a million barrels locally so it's so it's highly unlikely that enough oil burned up in that fire it's not highly unlikely it's impossible that enough oil burned up in that single fire to cause a uh, a a huge dip um, and it would have been the oil product. So, you know, 
for whatever reason. I, it, it really does. It comes down to fudgy numbers because there's no logical. Now, the O5 is a good excuse to do it, and they close the info. And, and, and by the way, I said that when it started. I said this is a great insurance buyer because, you know, it's completely consuming, and uh, they get to shut down this, uh, this whole refinery and cause an artificial shortage in gasoline on the east coast of the United States. And they don't have to open it back up because they're going to get paid in cash. It's a, such a win-win for the companies because they, they they now produce the same amount of oil in all their other yeah, in all their other refineries. They get paid more money for doing it. They get the insurance money for sh instead of shutting down, decommissioning, and taking costs on the old refinery. They're actually getting a big giant check for having it for having it burned to a crisp. And um, and and now and and because of that, they have an excuse to artificially move these numbers around, and nobody's being suspicious because they go, "Oh yeah, that refinery fire. That must be why we have a twenty million barrel shift in oil all of a sudden." That's that's not it. That's not the factor, and it's not statistically possible for a hundred million, uh, not even a hundred million, to, for two hundred million U.S. drivers to suddenly drive ten percent more or less. It makes no sense. In a non-holiday weekend, what the hell do they do? So something fishy is going on here, but to figure it out, you would have to get on the ground and investigate and you know do all sorts of things that nobody's ever going to do. You're not going to get them to do it. I would do it if I had the time. It'd be fun. But <laughs> I would take a very long amount of time to get to the bottom of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> John says you need to play the X Files theme song whenever you run the numbers through the fuzzy math on the uh, treat inventory reports. You're right, because it's out there. Uh, let's see. X. I don't think you guys can hear it when I play something on the computer. They they cleverly make it so that. Let me see. Yeah, there we go. It's my, it's my understanding you guys can't hear this because somehow or other it, it blocks out anything that's being played on the computer. I don't know how that works because I can hear it in my ears, but you guys can't hear it through the speaker. Anyway, maybe I'll be some good part. Here we go. There's a whistling. I'm enjoying it, whether or not you guys can hear it. <laughs> but yeah, it's crazy. There's weird stuff going on. Look, this reservoir has 96 million black holes. What happened? I don't want to know. All right, I'm not going to start with that. So where were we? Okay, so that's all fun. Shh. <laughs> so that's all fun stuff. Now, what else have we got going on? Oh, so what did we talk about today? I don't even know what we talked about today. Um, Well, Dow's only up 25 now, getting worse and worse. All right. Ah, anyway, so this was all in the grand context of what the hell is going on in the world. So, uh, so there's a lot of reasons to be concerned, and 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 if there's no trade deal, things are going to turn ugly very, very quickly. So you've got to be ready to slap on more hedges, and you have to identify the hedges you want to put on and and for example if we go to the short-term portfolio and i haven't updated it so don't get excited by whatever it is let's see um like the oop is probably not up 213 percent um certain short calls may have expired um Nothing says, oh, here you go. Like these FNSR June 22 calls, well, no, they probably did expire pretty much worthless. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that we, that we haven't made the adjustments because I went away, so I didn't make the, I didn't log in the adjustments that we made. And, um, and also that sometimes things can be a little bit wonky right after expirations. Um, I, I very much doubt we gained that much so far. So ignore that, but. The bottom line is what you don't ignore though is how are we doing on our hedges? Okay. So you have to be very, very aware of your hedges and how you can improve them if you want to. Uh, so right now, this TLT hedge 
if I were to remove these uh, short puts, they've got a 36% profit, and the profit on them offsets a loss on the TLT, and that's, and that's a bet that interest rates are going up, not down, and the Fed has not been very helpful with that at all. So is that a hedge that we want to use for press? We're back up on top. I think so. I think I'll take my 30% gain because if I, if I just have the naked short puts, the, I'm sorry, the naked long puts, if we get a spike back down, I can cash in quickly. Whereas if we keep the short puts, um, we're stuck because we have to buy them out for a higher price. <coughs> so that's one way to increase our, our head, to increase our, uh, our hedging level is to take away some of the covers. The same thing goes to these guys. The short $50 calls are down 50% already. We made $19,500. Yes, we have a loss in the uh, long calls, but I don't care. We made $20,000 we can lock in. I don't, I'm not locking in my loss. I'm locking in the game. I can always sell more more short puts, but we made in um, in one month we made nineteen thousand five hundred dollars. I still have these. I didn't lose them. And in fact, if I if I take the nineteen thousand five, right? This is what I call leapfrogging. If I take the nineteen five profit here, and we're going to do this, and that's definite because this is something you should do. So these are January twenty twenties. Um, all products. Uh, what is it? SQQQ. SQQQ. Okay. And remember, we talked about like Apple. It, it is possible Apple can be screwed. Doubtful, but possible they can screw Apple. Um, so those were what the thirty. Uh, what was it? We have the 35 calls. So here's the 35 calls. We own these. We sold these. So if we buy back the 50s for, three, for 350, 340, whatever, we buy back the 50s, we uh, spend how much? We go down to the 30s, let's say. This is how you lock in your position. So in other words, the S&P went, went um, higher. Not the S&P, the NASDAQ. They all went higher. The NASDAQ went higher, forcing my hedge lower. So the hedge is now down to 35. Even though I'm in the money, I can roll down. This is 640 and this is 840. So for $2, I can roll down $5 in position. That's a no brainer. If I'm going to stick with a hedge, if I'm going to maintain a hedge, why would I not do that? So I'm going to spend two dollars to have a five dollar better position, and then all I have to do, if I'm so inclined, is to sell short calls for more than three forty. So for five forty, so what can I sell for five forty? I can sell the thirty eights. I can sell the forties for four eighty. That's close enough. So if we switch to the thirty forty spread, I would then be recouping. Uh, most of what I'm spending on the roll. So the roll is essentially free, but now we've locked the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ gains in our long-term portfolio are being locked in because now I'm saying it, it, that, that my hedge is the 30-40. So now if the NASDAQ goes down at all, I'm going to be all in the money there and make the money that I want, that I was looking to make up to $10 per contract. So what did we start with? We started with a net $4, so it was net four when we started. We might spend another dollar, it makes it net five, but then that means that my upside becomes $25,000 at 40. And, that, and like I said, that's if we roll these to the 30s, roll these to the 40s. Not gonna do that, I wanna be more aggressive. So what I'm probably gonna do is roll these to the 30s and then roll half of these. Take buy all these back and then sell 25 of the 40s. Or maybe we'll sell some 2021 40s and collect more money. So let's see, the 2021, oh yeah, look at the 2021 40s are $9. That's pretty freaking attractive. Let's see, we can, oh, we can sell the 45s to eight. That's my move. 
All right, so we'll sell we'll sell half the 45s for eight. Well, now, why am I willing to do this? Because we're always going to buy hedges, always. So even if we cash, even if we cash these out, okay, even if we cash out the um, the 30s here after we roll them, whatever. And let's say these go. Let's say these double up to 16. We're certainly going to cash them out if they go to 16. So let's say we go to 16, and um, and we cash these out. We make a huge amount of money. But obviously, these guys are going to be up a lot too. They'll be they'll be up probably also at 16. They'll they'll gain about as much as ours will, and will no longer be covered. Now we're not going to stay uncovered. We would then buy either a 2022 spread that covers it, or we would buy some January uh, 2020s to cover it. But we would flip to some kind of cover, but we'd still be taking a lot of money off the table. That would be a profit. All right, and then we would cover into the trade. But we know that we're always going to have a hedge. Therefore, it doesn't matter if we have some short calls because we're always going to have them covered with something. And we're willing to buy more and more to lock in our gains. Because what are we doing now? We initially spent... <clears throat> We initially spent uh, $20,000 on a uh, $75,000 hedge. That's a good deal, right? So we spent $20,000 on a $75,000 hedge. Now we're going to spend more money to lower the to lower the strike. But that was from 5:30, and let's take a look. This is on the Nasdaq. So from Oh, that is a big, that is blown up. So here we were here. All right. So now at this point, we spent $20,000. Now we're way up here. Obviously, our long term portfolio gained a ton of money to offset the very small loss we have on this position. But now we're going to re hedge, move the hedge so that any dip below where we are now is going to pay us um, not $50,000, but. Um, how many were there? Ah, what did I just do? This thing. So originally it paid up to 75, so we could have made 55. When we move it, we're going to go to the 35, I mean, I'm sorry, we're going to go to the 30 calls, and if we cap it, part of it at 40, it won't be capped at 40, we're going to cap it at 45. Well, 45 is the same spread, but if we cap it at 40, we would limit our upside to um, to fifty thousand dollars total. We would have put in a little bit more money, so it's a twenty-five thousand dollar upside instead of a uh, fifty thousand dollar upside or fifty-five thousand dollar upside. But we have less protection, but from a much higher point. So we're already in the money. If the Nasdaq doesn't go up, we get paid. So we change the nature of the spread and we're locking in our gains. Now, what happens if the NASDAQ keeps going up? Then we just basically, we're going to make more money in the portfolio and we're going to roll it again and change it again and uh, reposition it. But of course, if the NASDAQ kept going up, I would probably get more nervous and want a wider spread to cover it. But right now at this level, I'm going to be, I just want to keep myself in a good position to win in case it goes down. So that's so we're probably going to end up rolling to a half cover is the most likely thing here. So here we're going to buy back the short the short puts, but it's not a very expensive hedge. I'm not worried about that play. This is an expensive hedge. We're going to buy these guys back for sixteen thousand dollars. All right. Then we're going to offset that by selling uh, maybe twenty of those twenty twenty one. So we're going to offset the entire cost of the spend here. That means we're still in for net twenty thousand dollars on the spread on a half covered spread. So I really like that. There's no reason not to do that. Other than, of course, like I said, the 2021 short calls is obviously going to make you a bit nervous and we will have to adjust, but I know that we're going to always, always have hedges. So it's never going to be uncovered. Come January, we're going to roll to another, to an April hedge and then come April, we'll roll to a July hedge. We're never going to not have a hedge that covers the very long short calls. And if the NASDAQ never goes down, they'll expire worthless, and it's no big deal. If the NASDAQ does go down, it'll diminish how much money we make on the shorter-term hedge, but it won't stop us from cashing out, setting up a new position. 
All right, so it's it's a leapfrog thing. It's like it goes up, we move again. If it moves again, if it goes, the market moves, then we move again. But we always keep ourselves in a position that can make money. <clears throat> now TZA happens to be okay. We we got aggressive on that. We bought back the short calls. We have a hundred naked short uh, long calls, and they're at eight, and TZA is at like ten bucks. So they're in the money. We paid three. They're now two and a, two and a bit. We're not very behind on these at all, and we're in a great position to make a ton of money if it goes up. And this is, don't forget, only the OOP. This isn't even the short-term portfolio. This is just what we have hedging the options opportunity portfolio, which is only a $300,000 portfolio. So it's, it's not a very big portfolio. We've got some big hedges. This one here, TZA, where do you go? There. This TZA here is already worth uh, twenty something thousand dollars, twenty four thousand dollars. If um, if the Russell falls twenty percent, this is going to go up sixty percent. That's four bucks, right? Uh, it's four eighty actually. So anyway, so four more bucks on a hundred is forty thousand dollars. So this is a forty thousand dollar hedge against a twenty percent drop in the in the S and P. This is fifty, and the thirty five is going to move a lot more. Because you know they changed the Nasdaq, so we we uh, they did that reverse split. So um, so thirty five times one point six is fifty six. So that would make a fortune, obviously, at fifty six. Um, that's some ridiculous amount of money. Uh, obviously, every ten dollars is fifty thousand dollars. So we have fifty thousand here, fifty thousand here, easily. Um, 10,000 plus here, six, so that's uh, 100,000, 110,000. And I, do, we, do we have DXDs in here? And we have the DXDs. And DXD also would probably need to be repositioned as well because it's gone down. We're up 40% here, it's the same deal. We buy these back, we roll these down, we find something else. And what's up with these? I guess we just left those from a previous trade because they don't make any sense by themselves. Oh yeah, we sold puts and something else. So you know that. So that's the hedges. So, we, so meanwhile, we have half of this portfolio is hedged. Half of the total value of the portfolio is hedged. And I still think we should be doing better. I really don't trust this top right now. In the short-term portfolio, oh my God, look at that, 666. <laughs> so we got 666 in the short-term portfolio. And um, so that, that's a healthy amount. Uh, in here, are we adequately, it's the same story with TLT. We're going to buy those back and, and free it up. We're up 83% on these. I mean, what's the point of them? There's no point in the put that's up 83%. Just cash it in. Um, so we're going to cash that in. We're going to roll these higher. Uh, TNA, that we're not up on the TNA. We have the, what, what the hell is this? We have the 65 puts. What? Oh, no, that's right. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm thinking, I'm looking at TLT. Going, what do we do here? We, we shorted TNA, that's confusing. So TNA is the ultra long. So we have the 65 puts, it goes all the way to 35. We're not gonna change that. That's $120,000 hedge there. And we only spent only spent 30 something, that 34,000. So we got a $90,000 profit on this one if TNA crashes out. Um, we have this big DXD play here also. We'll take a look at that. Um, it's no longer in the money. So we're certainly gonna roll it. There's no point in having the hedge. If you're gonna have the hedge, you've gotta spend the money to maintain your hedge, maintain your hedges, just like uh, gardening. You know, you gotta, you gotta stick with it. Um, soybeans is doing good, MJ is uh, normal. All right, so SQQQ, here we got the same thing. It's the same thing, we're definitely gonna roll it down because that roll's pretty cheap. So we're gonna do the roll. We're going to, oh man, that's a lot of money. Um, we are, but, but, Still, why would we not do it? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna buy back. We're up forty something percent. We're gonna buy these back, and they're twenty twenty one. So we're gonna buy all of them back because I'd rather have shorter term calls that we sell because they're easier to expire. Even though we did phenomenally well on these, 
I would rather I would rather work with others. And look what happened here. We took a ninety-eight thousand dollar hit here, but we made eighty-seven thousand dollars. So we only lost eleven thousand dollars, and we're going to now be able to roll to a much better spread and lock in our gains. So what did it cost us to have this hedge? This very aggressive hedge cost us eleven thousand dollars since like last month. Okay, and we're going to now be able to roll it for no cost to us. We're not the same thing we did, I was just looking at before. For basically no cost to us, we're going to roll this hedge, which is a massive hedge. We're going to roll it to a much more aggressive hedge that further locks in our gains. Is that not worth eleven thousand dollars? Of course it is. We 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 made phenomenal money in the long term portfolio, the short term portfolio, and everything. I mean, it, I'm sorry, the. Uh, the long term and whatever. The long term has got to be up to some crazy number right now. Let's see where we are. One, get out of here. Obviously, this can't, there has to be things in here that are having error. There's no way we're up 192%. I mean, that's like um, $1.46 million, you know, which is, very high. I, I, I think we're at 1.2 something. I don't know. Whatever. It's way too much money. So, you know, once we resolve it, what, you know, and again, what I say is probably wrong. What it probably is, is that something expired and you look for things that say 100% even, like this. Here you go. So here's a C. Oh, obviously, these June 600 calls of CMG did not expire worthless. Okay. We rolled them. And I haven't logged it in yet. So we, we take a loss on these. We have other calls, blah, blah, blah. So there's, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I think I think CMG is still at 700. So we're at, there's $80,000. It's not being accounted for at the moment because they, they didn't expire worthless. But they, since they no longer are active, um, this thing zeroes them out. So that, that's when you say, how come we're up so much? That's why we're up so much. Is these Disney short calls also shouldn't it be at zero? So that caused a big gain. Um, so, you know, once we account for those properly, we go back to a normal number. That's why that number is, there was no way we were at 190%. No, but there aren't too many. It's just really Disney and CMG. Those are the only ones that got zeroed out. And they're both plowing along at pretty highs. But anyway, so the long-term portfolio made good money, not as good as it looks, but good money. Money talk, um, that wouldn't have had anything expired. That's back up to 158, which is huge. How's Hemp Boca doing? Hemp Boca is even making a profit now. Uh, we looked at the OOP. Okay, we look, oh, Butterfly, how's Butterfly doing? Butterfly also has rolling issues though, I think. Um, who's up 100% exactly? This one, oh, two of these. Yeah, so the whirlpools are not correct. Mm, that's it, though. Not so bad. Where is whirlpool? Whirlpool's at 140. These might have actually both expired worthless. We have the short 145s and the short 125 puts. I think those did both expire worthless. Wow, that'd be cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, next week we'll have the right numbers. Um, but the point is, we made a ton of money in the portfolios. We lose 11000 on a hedge. So what? That's the point. We're locking in these gains. So of all this money that we gained, hundreds of thousands of dollars, we're taking 11000 20000 30000 whatever it works out to, and we're upping the hedges to further lock in these gains. So that if the market ever does crash, which you know seems like that's not a thing it does, but if it ever crashes, we're going to get a large chunk of money back from our shorts, and we will hopefully hold most of the gains that we get. So effectively, it's like, that's where it's every time it goes up and you ratchet your hedges, and it goes up and you ratchet your hedges, and it goes up and you ratchet your hedges, and yeah, you keep throwing money into hedges. It's annoying, and you keep losing money on the hedges, but you're locking in the gains. I wouldn't be so aggressively long if I didn't know that if the market fell backwards, I am pretty well covered by my short hedges. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be aggressively long, and then we wouldn't be making this kind of money. It all balances out, balances everything. See, we have any questions? Nobody has a question. That's good. Okay, cool. All right. So that's hedging, that's a portfolio, and let's take a look at what we were doing today then. <sighs> 
So uh, obviously the market started off well because the steam nation saying the trading, you know, hopefully we'll do something with China, blah, blah, blah. We're 90% of the way there on the trade deal. Um, <laughs> so we've been 90% of the way for 10 months. So we're 90% of the way there for six months. And like I said, six months ago, I pointed out, six months ago, they said we were 100% done. So if now we're 90% done, six months from now, we're going to be 80% done? Is it, getting, is it unraveling? I'm not sure what you know what all the fuss is about. Um, the data is terrible. Durable goods was terrible. This is consumer confidence. And I pointed out that here's where Trump was elected. He was elected here. You know, somewhere around here he's elected in November, and he takes office here in January. And here's where consumer confidence is when he takes office. And so, the present situation for people. People are pretty off. To, people think their present situation is pretty good. That's important for the election, by the way, the present situation. But um, the the base confidence is not really up very much, and the forward future expectations is actually lower than when he took office. People are getting less and less confident about the future. People have jobs that really, that's what really bumps up the present situation. Everybody's people are employed, they're not looking for work. If you're in debt that you have a job and you're servicing your debt, you're not upset. It's only when the debt comes due or if you lose your job or if the rates start climbing that you start getting upset. So far, all of that is being prevented. But if that starts happening, this, this uh, top green line can plummet really, really fast expectations of people is is that it's going to start plummeting expectations of people is things are turning worse their expectations are things are getting worse that's what people see in this country and they are we did you know we did a couple articles last week about the inequality has become grotesque in this country and and that there's half the people in this country are getting decimated economically and by the way, those people don't participate in consumer confidence surveys because they don't have phones, they don't have houses, or they don't live in permanent housing. They're harder to find by the surveyors. The surveyors tend to miss the bottom, you know, they certainly miss the bottom 20% of the people who are, you know, who don't pick up the phone they, when it rings from numbers they don't know. And uh, and they don't go and they're not in the malls answering questions with by people taking surveys. Um, they're just not available for this sort of thing. So you so it's very in this electronic age we've really lost proper surveying because we don't tend to talk to the disenfranchised. They do, they just stay in the shadows and you know, nobody pays attention to them. So a lot of this stuff skews actually worse than it looks because over the years that's that situation has gotten worse and worse and worse. And there are lots of fascinating articles you can read about uh, polling bias, question bias in polling, so on and so forth. It's, it's, it never has been an exact science, but I, it's just getting worse because it's not as easy as it used to be for them to get a, for them to get people to participate in the polls. And and uh, the government doesn't really fund the surveys anymore. They were privately funded, and the private guys aren't going to sit there and spend more money. You know, it used to be for a government survey, your goal was to get it right. So the surveyors would come back to the government and say, no, no, we have to reformulate the questions because this and that is happening. They would see it in the field and say, no, whatever it takes to get it right, we need to get these numbers right because we rely on it. And so people think from, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, people think that the government, if they release numbers, they're super duper exact. That is no longer the case. They, they're, they're now using private polling agencies and they all cut corners and they all run algorithms and they're not necessarily correct. And they're certainly not talking to everybody. Well, I need to screw that up completely. So it's very, it's very tricky to get good survey data, but the trend is a trend. You know, I mean, if you compare like to like, especially over the short term, you assume they're talking to the same groups and finding out the same data and it's going down. That's not good. So the economic surprise is terrible too. Also, I didn't even notice this. I, I didn't realize that the, the uh, Russell has only up 11% since, 19, uh, since 2017. It's only 11% higher than it was. 
and the, and the NYSE, the two broad indexes, 15 and 11. Meanwhile, the Dow and the uh, S&P are up 30, and the Nasdaq's up 52 percent. So somebody's wrong. So either the either the Russell is the greatest long of all time, and it should be at 18. It should be at 1800, not 1500. And we've got miles and miles to go of gains in small cap America, or the S and P, the Dow, and the Nasdaq are, are pretty uh, crazily overpriced at the moment, and need a serious correction. Um, I I just. I feel in my gut that it's a little bit more likely that it's uh, that the uh, big index is going to correct back a bit. You know, I, I think 20% is too much, but a 10% correction that stays, and that's but that's where we are on the charts. That's where we keep saying it's going to be. I, I don't see. I think we're too high. This is this should be 29.50. I think not 25.90. What? This number is completely out to lunch. <laughs> that number is completely wrong for the for the Nasdaq, so it doesn't matter. So, oh no, no, 2,950 points. Oh no, that's why it seems wrong. It's 2,590 points. So it is like 50% of 5,000. That is crazy. That's why the number, I thought I was saying that was the number of the Nasdaq. That's not what I'm saying. None of these are the numbers of where the index is. They're the number of how many points we've gained since Trump took office. So that's a little crazy. Durable goods also, again, since Trump took office, down, 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 down. I, I, I don't know how many times you can say the same thing, right? It's just, it's not good. These are bad numbers, bad, bad, bad. Um, the big chart, look, generally we're just double topping. We punched a little higher on this on this thing, but we're just generally double topping all the way around. This guy, these guys are double topping the downtrend. The, the, when the double drop top doesn't violate the downtrending big lines, then you've got a serious downtrend. <clears throat> we can see some seriously low numbers here. Get my page down, but just page down. <sighs> Lots of news today. This is interesting. I mean, we know this, so, but it's really worth mentioning. It's un unprocessed food, not the crap you buy in a grocery store. Unprocessed food is so much better for you. Um, they're talking about eating the same food, except one's processed and one's not processed, and the difference is this in your and your weight. You know, it's a huge difference, huge changes. You're just not getting nutrition and whatever out of the processed foods, and and, and shouldn't really be eating them at all. <laughs> it should actually be banned. That would be tough because it would make everything much more expensive. Micron had a nice day, still having a nice day, going way up. And we, we just made an adjustment to our Micron trade. Um, in the long-term portfolio, we bought, because Micron was down here when we did the LTP review last week, I said we're going to take advantage of the, of the pullback and buy back the short calls. So we, we bought back all the short calls, not because we knew this was going to happen, but because we said this is... This is where the value takes us. You know, this is where we think it's going to bottom out. And you can say, well, yeah, it went lower here. It went lower there, but it basically held that line. That's, what, that's again, one of those spike downs that we throw out. In fact, really, you would throw out, uh, if you're charting this, I would throw out everything below the 34 line because it always comes back above. So it keeps coming back above the 34 line. That means just whatever this was, whatever stupidity caused this, it still essentially held 34 and came back and the longs, so the amount of time above, the area above, more than balanced out the area below. So this is something we could just throw out. It's not, it's not realistic. So if it's not realistic, I would throw I'm throwing out this top two. This is also unrealistic, but that's fine. So too high, too low, just right. So probably 40 is a good price around for microns or somewhere in 38, 40 range we should see them. Um, 
that's just eyeballing it, but, but also that's why we're in it in the first place. But anyway, so the bottom line is we're at 30 down here at 33, holding that line, which was the uh I don't know what line that is anyway. So it's not it's not a DMA, it's just a line, it's just a chart thing. I hate short thing. You can tell I'm not a TA guy. So it's a short thing. The bottom the, the bottom of the trading range. Um so we held that we held that line and we and so we did our review and I said, well, it's probably back to cover. Same thing I'm saying about um about the SQQs, right? I'm like, you know, when, when you're that much ahead, buy back to covers. Um in the OOP, we're we already made so we already made a very aggressive adjustment in the LTP. Now in the OOP, we're making another aggressive adjustment. Also, similar concept to the STP though, to the I'm sorry, to the SQQQ. And it's because we, we see a value in these things. It's not just random crap on a chart. When we see this, we don't say, oh no, this is a chart pattern X that says that, and it's gonna go down to here and whatever. No, we say 34, that's too cheap. These guys make this much money, they're being valued in this much money, therefore we buy them. It's a very simple decision when you're a technical trader. I don't know, when you're, when you're technical, when you're a fundamental trader, it's a simple decision because you just say, okay, that's too cheap, we buy it. We buy it, we buy back shortfalls, we get more aggressive, we sell more puts, whatever, you know, whatever it is. But the bottom line is we are, we think this is too cheap. Therefore, we are going to position ourselves more bullish in the trade that we're already in. It's a lot cheaper to position yourself more bullish in the trade you're already in than it is to buy new trades. So unless you really, really, really love something, it's better to do your adjustments first and spend your money there. Unless you have a really compelling story that's better than the stuff that you would otherwise be adjusting. There was that petroleum report before we found out what bullshit it all was. Is that holding up? Let's see what's oil doing. And it came back down a little bit, but not much. Not gasoline, though. Gasoline is just rocketing. Incredible. Uh, okay, let's see. KHC. Oh yeah, we're looking at you. I think mean, KHC too cheap, but could get cheaper because um, General Mills just had crappy report. Me and General Mills as well. But General Mills just had a had a crappy report. It's the staples business is slowing down. That's sad. But historically, they tend to bounce back, and I don't see what has really changed in the American diet. I mean, that is, is people still eat their macaroni and cheese at home or whatever. People still have kids. Um, so I like them down here. But again, there's no point in being in the stock if you're not going to keep yourself in a position that can make money. So in other words, if you have the 40 calls that you bought back here and now they're down to 30, Holding the 40 calls and hoping they go to 50 so you can get your money back is silly. You've got to roll yourself down to the 25s and there you're in the money and have a realistic spread that gets your money back. You can't, you can't have your plan of trading that the stock has to go up from 30 to 50. That's uh, 66%. That's just not likely to happen. I mean, you can see this downtrending line right here. They're telling you 40 is probably a cap. It's going to be hard to get over 40. 40 is 33% higher than this. So again, it's hard to get over 40. Several reasons it's going to be hard to get back over 40. Their business is not that fantastic right now. Hard to get back over 40. New CEO is coming into town. He still might tank a quarter. He's a new CEO. He wants to throw every single garbagey thing into the into onto the books so he makes sure that it's not his fault. That's what new CEOs do. I call that tanking the quarter. They tank the quarter or they kitchen sink it. That's another term, it's kitchen sink it. And kitchen sink it means you throw out everything but the kitchen sink in the company. Every bad thing, every bad division, every layoff, and you just do all your write downs and all your markdowns and everything now so that when you come in, you say, well, my predecessor had uh, you know, all this crap here, but since then I have turned this company around like you would not believe. That's what CEOs want to do. They get compensated for turning the company around. So they want to start off in a bad base. And the board, by the way, agrees with that, which is why a lot of times you read about CEO compensation 
and it's actually understated by an incredibly wide margin because they talk about the actual compensation or the deal, but they don't talk about the fact that a lot of boards will let the CEO tank the quarter when he comes in and say from that quarter forward is how we're going to mark you. So he, so they know that he's giving himself a massive bonus by by trapping out the quarter that they're in, and then from that time forward he's going to have easy comps. That's part of his incentive. But also it stops the uh, the other sh it stops the the shareholders and it stops the uh, the uh, regulators from freaking out that you compensated this guy some ridiculous amount of money. You did compensate a ridiculous amount of money, but it's not very obvious. It's just based on he has bonus compensation based on performance, but the performance is based on a very low comp. See, it's all part of the game. It's all it's all stuff going on behind the scenes. So anyway, bottom line is though that. We're still looking at Kraft possibly doing more. They already wrote off with a ton of Kraft last quarter. Now this quarter coming up, they might do it again. So they come to that big, you got to you got to really dig in before you figure out all the things you can write off and and knock down. The good news is going forward, they won't be paying taxes for a very long time. They have, they have all these write offs, but they don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to pay tax on it. They do have easy comps. They should show better numbers going forward, but it's a long term play. It's not a quick thing. And I postulated here that I think I think Berkshire Hathaway would probably consider 40 to be the buyout price. I mean, I'm not saying they definitely want to give them 40. It's not that they're dying to give them 40, but you, you're never going to get them to accept 35. So you got to be in this range anyway. And I think that they don't want competing bidders and they want to take it out and they can justify 40. So I think 40 would be a probable buyout price for Berkshire, maybe 37.50 if they if they tank the next quarter. But they also have to get rid of this adventure fund called 3G that's uh, um, agitating for board seats and all this stuff. So Buffett has to deal with them first and then take the company private. But they're, they're a perfect addition to Berkshire's portfolio. You know, he likes that kind of stuff. So if he took them private, um, and I said they have like um, $20 billion worth of debt. So he would buy them for $50 billion at 40. All right, which is a, quite a large way up from where we are now. I mean, now they're at 30 something, 30, da, da, da. They're at 37.5 now. So it's a big, big payoff to, to buy them out for 40. Um, it's not like anyone's going to say no, and it's not very likely somebody else is going to come in and try to compete. Um, so, but if, if Berkshire spends $50 on the 50 billion on the buyout and another 20 billion to wipe out the debt, Instead of KHC paying dividends anymore, there's no more shareholders, right? He's buying out all the shareholders. So the $3 billion they pay in dividends goes to Buffett. The $1.3 billion they pay in interest on their debt goes to Buffett, as well as the capital for debt servicing goes to Buffett. But we didn't even talk about that. And then, of course, they have their basic $3 billion profit. So you're talking about $7.3 billion back on Buffett's $70 billion investment. That is a nice return on investment and then you go and say well was that something Berkshire Hathaway would be interested in so VRK A Berkshire Hathaway and Berkshire Hathaway no where's the thing income statement so Berkshire Hathaway has really moved the needle on these guys right because they make $21 billion from operations. If they start making $7 billion more, it's going to increase his entire stock. His return on investment, actually, though, you know, his total revenue is $60 billion, and they're making $21 billion on $60 billion. So they make 30% on their money, on their, on their revenues. But the way they do it, though, is they would have a holding company consolidating. So actually what happens is the $7.3 billion they collect from Kraft would be this money. And then this is the internal operation of, of uh, Berkshire. So Kraft would just be turning over their profits to Berkshire Hathaway. They wouldn't, you know, that's, that's the way they run it. They, they, some of the money internally would go to bonuses and things to people, but there would no longer be profits to drop to uh, craft, it would just all accrue over to Berkshire. And so what would happen in Berkshire, there was a 10% bump in their revenues, and they would have very, very little, obviously, uh, to, they don't have to bump up their g &A or anything else like that. So it would come in at uh, pushing up this number to $28 billion a year. So would Buffett want to do that? Sure he would. Why wouldn't he? 
That's a very logical move to make. You know, that's what they want. Berkshire wants to be a cash machine with money coming in all the time. This is this this picking up PG, I'm oh, sorry, PG, picking up craft would fund a lot of additional acquisitions. So what Buffett's doing is taking some of the $121 million billion dollars they have in the bank, taking wouldn't take all 70 billion. He probably bought, he would arrange to borrow some money or whatever and have his own loan, but he would take out their loan and become the lender to craft which he would feel is a solid, you know, repayment, something you don't have to worry about. They're gonna get 5% interest on that while they wait to get repaid. And they control all the operations, pick up all the dividends, pick up all the profits from the company. So that's, it's, it's very compelling for Berkshire to buy them. So we'll see, but that's, that seems to be, it gets more and more likely as Kraft languishes um, KFT. As Kraft, wait, oh, KHC, sorry, KHC. As they languish down here, it becomes more and more likely that they'll structure a deal. But first, Berkshire has to take out the venture company. And to do that, he actually wants them to tank another quarter and to have problems and, and to have the, uh, the, I think, 3D capital to have them throw up their hands and be sick of the thing. He needs that in order to do his buyout. Otherwise, he's going to be button heads with them over the price and all that. So it's very interesting, but that's that's where we are. Um, questions, any questions? Oh no, is TZA splitting now? You've gotta be kidding me. Oh. All right, so uh, Matt says, um, if TZA splits tomorrow, should we close and rebuy Monday? I don't know that I want to be unhedged. Um, usually, usually these things are liquid enough that you can get out of them while you're buying the other ones and, and do it smoothly. Um, or sometimes the broker does it for you, so it depends. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, I hate to incur the cost if I don't have to. Um, you know, think or swim tends tends to do it for you, and then and it's cost free. Like you end up with just a new the new options in your account. Um, so I don't know. I don't think that that could be. I, I think on the whole, to avoid headaches, obviously it's good to get out. But I wouldn't want to go into the weekend uncovered. So if they are doing it tomorrow, which sucks because it's already Thursday, then. Um, uh, I guess I guess I would bump up the DSDs or the QQQs or something like that, but I would hate to go into this weekend without a cover. I hate to go into any weekend. This is the G20 weekend, though. It's, you don't want to be in with no cover, so you want to trade it in for something else if you're going to go that way. We're not going to do that. We're going to stick with what we have and uh, and deal with the adjustments after the fact. All right, but yeah, it is, it is very annoying when they do that sort of thing. I mean, it, took us all, it took us a week to fix the FQQQs because they, uh, they, they didn't put out the new options for a while. But it's not that the old ones don't work because they're still there, but nobody trades them. That's what the problem is. Um, let's see. So if we go to trade SQQQ, see these, these are the old ones. And it's still here, but what happens is the the spreads get the bid ask spreads get wider and wider, and nobody actually trades them. You know, I mean, there are you know, there's there's not even a last for some of these. So those they, those get kind of ugly if you if you wait too long. Um, but close up, you do it close to the time and see how this spread is only uh, this spread is only twenty cents. That's a normal spread, twenty cents normal spread. 20 cents normal thread. If you're in an unpopular call though, then the spread gets wider and wider. If you're in it, so that's why, by the way, that's one of the reasons I always I always play the 25, 30, 35, 40. I don't tend to play the 32s or whatever on a short term, on a long term play. I don't do that because if they split, it's very difficult to unwind from a, from an odd number, from a not an odd, from a from a un, ugh, a non-rounded number. Rounding includes the fives. But if you're, you know, 5, 10, 20, whatever, those are, those are usually easy to unload. But if you want to try to get rid of 38s, 
the spread can get very wide on you because nobody actually wants the 38s. But, but generally, you're just trying to, you know, you're just going to unwind these positions. And um, let's see if we have an example of that. You don't have an example. All these are very wide. You know, and so, so you want to, what you want to do is when they transition, if your broker isn't automatically doing it for you, you want to put in a sell of, you know, like if I had the tens, I, I see 115 is the last transaction. I'd want to put in a sell at 120. You know, I want to get I want to get at least 120, and at the same time, I would put in a buy on the. Um, well, let's see. These were four to one, right? So these would be the 40s. So if I want to go straight over. I get 120 here. That means I would pay. That means I'm willing to pay 480 here. It says 490 now. But think about it. If I if I offer 480 on the 40s on the on the on the on the new 40s, right? If I offer 480 and I ask 120 on the other ones, one of them are going to fill as the as SQQ moves. They're not both going to not fill. If SQQ goes down, I'll get my price on the ones I want to buy. If SQQ goes up, I'll get my price on the ones I want to sell. So I'm going to ask for a good price on both legs. I'm going to ask for a good price and I'm going to offer a low price. And if I do that on both legs, as one fills, I will then say, okay, now I can afford to raise my offer just a bit or whatever, just on the other side. But I'm going to get a good price either way for the leg that I'm exiting. I'm, you know, I'm sorry, either, either for the leg I'm exiting or for the new leg I'm buying, one of those, I'm going to get a good price. And then I have to work on the other leg. But you should never get a bad price on both legs. It's not really possible if you do it correctly, but you have to think about the mechanics of what you're offering and how it's going to go. And, and also, by the way, the mechanics of whether or not that covers you in a certain way that you're going to have a problem with. So in other words, if I become uncovered because I get my 120 in the cell, when I do the cell, I get the 120, but I can't fill the... Um, and I can't fill the new ones, then the first thing I say is, well, if this price got too high, then the short calls probably got higher too. And therefore, I think about selling the short calls quickly to take advantage of their price rise, and then it lowers the effective cost of what I'm paying. So you, you just have to think mechanically about how everything affects everything else and make your decisions on the fly as that goes by. But that's the best way to fill these things out. <clears throat> um, John says, it, so it looks, uh, so it looks like Bitcoin euphoria is setting in. Bitcoin is nearing 14,000. Holy cow. I'd love to short them just to figure out a price range to do it in. Any thoughts on ripping these coin junkies off? Well, John, um, I agree that Bitcoin is ridiculous. I think it's just no different than buying Beanie Babies. Um, there's no real value to a Bitcoin other than the value. That's, and that's your whole currency, by the way. It's not different than other currency. But there's no value to Bitcoin other than what people are willing to pay for it and what they're willing to trade it for and so on and so forth. You trade Bitcoin for X amount of dollars. So that's why two months ago it was 3,000 and now it's uh, 12 or 14,000, whatever the hell it's up to now. Um, but unfortunately, there's no reason it can't go to 20 and there's no reason it can't go to $50,000. You know, there's no level of idiocy. And by the way, as I mentioned early on in the cycle, I said you can't get in the way of Bitcoin because what's happened since the last cycle is all these people, and I don't want to say, I'm bad with statistics today apparently, I can't remember my numbers, but I would say something like one third of all the Bitcoins are owned by 15 people, something like that was the number we were looking at. So basically one third of all the Bitcoins are held by 15 people. Those 15 people are still billionaires. They're all billionaires, every single one. Um, they were multi-billionaires, and they they lost from twenty thousand dollars to three thousand dollars. They lost ten billion dollars or whatever. Like, you know, let's say they were all worth ten billion. Now they're worth one or two billion dollars each, from being worth ten billion plus when Bitcoin was higher. So. A wounded billionaire is a dangerous creature. <laughs> so, so what these guys have learned is to 
work together, cooperate, spend money on PR, uh, keep the mythos of Bitcoin going, encourage more and more people to use Bitcoin, so on and so forth. Rather than being passive like they were last time and they were subject to the, the market forces that drove Bitcoin up and then crashed it, they are now much more actively promoting Bitcoin and getting around and going and having people talk about Bitcoin and putting together events and so on and so forth. Everything is Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Um, they're, they're heavily promoting what they've got, talking their book effectively. So the, I, you have to be very careful because they are getting organized and, they, and the, more, the more success they have, the more money they have to keep promoting it. And, and these guys, are, they, they, they learned a very terrible lesson uh, a couple of years ago when Bitcoin collapsed and they didn't, that they still have billions and billions of dollars. And they, they, they basically are all working much harder now to promote Bitcoin and try to get it to be something. Just like Zuckerberg is doing now with his coins. You know, Zuckerberg's got a coin that's going to blow these things out of the water, but that's going to be a year from now or so. And the governments are getting very nervous, though, because, the, you know, once Facebook starts having a coin, you know, mo you know, most people in most countries are going to trust Facebook more than their local currency. So, you know, Facebook has a coin that's coming out. That's going to become huge. That's going to make Zuckerberg billions and billions of additional dollars, too, no matter how much they say it's not. So everything is going to be kind of crazy. Um, but anyway, you can't short it. It's, it's just, it's so crazy dangerous. There's no safety in it. Um, is it GBTC? Uh, GBTC? Is that the right thing? No? GTBC? No? Wait. GBTC. Oh, Bitcoin Trust. Yeah, sorry, that is it. Okay, so the Bitcoin Trust has no options. <laughs> they have two dollars today. You know, and and I, it's just it's really it, it would be nice if you could short it somehow, and if they had options, you could limit your risk or something, or, or you know, but but there's nothing there. So, I, you know, and and moving two dollars on it, it was you know it was fifteen dollars this morning. Now it's seventeen. I actually just clicked over to 17 now. So I just clicked up higher. Um, it's a freight train. So I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I know how tempting it is. I know how exciting it'll be to do it. You know, look, when we we bought bitcoins when they were, I think they were 400 bucks when we bought them, and we bought four, and. Um, and we used two of them to buy a green coin, which ended up dying, basically. Um, so we had a lot of green coin that we exchanged our Bitcoins for. And um, then when the, but when the Bitcoins went to um, near 20,000, about 17,000, I said to Greg, I said, I said, we got to sell these things. I said, they were suddenly worth 34,000 for two coins. Plus, it wasn't just 34 either, because we had the 34,000 for the Bitcoins, plus we had um, they did a fork at some point, and then we had those Bitcoin other things, Bitcoin Cash, I forget what they were called. But anyway, we had those other things that were worth money too, and they were worth a few thousand dollars each. So we just dumped the whole thing. And that was effectively how we got out. But we, we got out there. I didn't turn around and short it. I, I wish I did, obviously, because I was short 20,000 was going to be the top. Um, 14, way too dangerous. But even if it goes back to 20, like I said, there's just too much promotional vehicle behind this thing now. And um, and it, it, you're gonna it's it's you, you see so many little press releases and things every single day about Bitcoin, 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 and um, there's too many people going around on the, on the news circuit, on the financial circuit, talking about it. So it's just not something I feel comfortable shorting. All right, this, the market on the other hand, I do feel comfortable shorting, especially as a hedge, because we have our longs to offset the hedges. I don't feel comfortable at all pretending this is going to just keep going up and up. You can see how weak we're looking right now. Um, that's what we got to be careful of. So I'm going to go back to the site. I'm going to make our adjustments, and um, we're going to lock in the gains that we do have, and hopefully uh, they won't get. We will have a little bit less of a sell. We'll have less of a dip in our portfolio values than we had last time because we're going to be a bit more aggressive this time in locking in our gains. We're very lucky we got a chance to get this high again. 
and I, and again, I, I really would rather just sell everything and go to cash. Um, I, I don't know. I still might. I mean, on, honestly, next week, if, if we don't have a trade deal with China and the market starts tanking, I'm not sure. But, you know, I think we can hold 10 percent and a 10 percent correction is almost not even worth getting out of our positions for. I, but especially if we can cash in. So I'm going to set ourselves up to be in a very good position and to take a lot of cash off the table if we have a dip. Um, but but still, it's, you know, I, I'm just not going to be comfortable having so much money on, on open positions. So, you know, it, again, it goes back to my kids' college funds still in cash. Never went back in. You know, and the reason for that is because the kind of college funds they have, which are tax free, five something, whatever they whatever they are, um, five fifteen accounts or something like that. Um, they can only invest in ETFs. There's no good ETFs to hedge with. So I just opted since they both are fully funded for their colleges uh, because they've done very well over the last you know twenty years uh, because they're because they're fully funded for the colleges. I'm not going to risk losing a year of their college on the market. You know, a 25% drop in the portfolio is a year of college gone. And I, you know, obviously they're going to dig into my pocket and take the money out. Why would I do that? I have tax-free money right now to pay for their college. So what am I risking? I'm, I'm risking complete idiocy. I'm risking having to use my taxable money to pay for their, to pay for a year of college. I'm risking my money. That money doesn't do them any good to get more of it. Once their college is paid for, it's paid for. So from, you know, so it's, it, there's a purpose to what that account is and I've got no reason to risk it. And I consider these markets just way too risky to have that kind of money. In. You know, so, you know, it's, that's how I feel about it. And if, if this money is, is money that matters to you and you have to count on it in the future, I would seriously consider lightening up because we're at a very, very scary inflection point. And I think there's just the assumptions that the Fed you have the assumptions that the Fed is going to lower rates, probably not right. You have the assumption, they can't both be right. You have the assumption that we're gonna have a trade deal with China. That's probably not gonna happen in the near future. You've got uh, oil possibly uh, spiking back up over the summer and, and impacting drivers. And you have a lot of downward and economic news. There's too many things that are, that are nasty in the market to haphazardly just keep going and pretending everything is okay. So if it's money that matters to you, I would strongly suggest lightening up. Hedging is not good enough. Getting, getting to more cash is the way to go. Lighten up, keep flexible. There'll be other opportunities to buy things. We see those all the time, but there's no reason to just stay in positions unless you feel they're a tremendous bargain. You know, and, and again, positions that you don't mind if they drop 20% more, you don't mind being in them and adjusting them as properly. If you don't, if you will mind, if you imagine the position being down 20 more percent and you say, oh, that'll suck and I'm not going to want to put more money into it, then get out now. That's what I'm saying. Don't hold anything you don't love and that you're not willing to commit more money to. Because we could be heading for a uh, at least a 10% correction in the near future. It only takes a couple of things to go wrong, and that's where we're going to be. All right, so be very, very careful out there, guys. Um, one last one. Terry says she saw a news flash on NAK concerning regulation rumors. Is this something we've been waiting for? Ah, well, let's find out. That's worth looking up. Uh, but it's rumors, so we'll see. N N A K. <laughs> Northern Dynasty, ooh, 30%, very good. See, my kids have this one. This is what they have in their purse, in there. In, in my kids' uh, individual portfolios for their, for their life, the one people they actually have, they, they both have accounts. Um, I buy a lot of speculative penny stocks, or relatively a lot, anyway. So I buy, that's where I buy my, my speculative stocks. So I have things like liquid metal, and NAK, um, and um, uh, I said liquid metal, I think, hey, I'm trying to think what else is in there. A couple, of, a couple of small stocks. Now, I don't like to buy penny stocks generally, but for the kids, when I see something that could become a, a, a 10 bag or plus, it's fun to get, you know, put a thousand here, a thousand there for the kids, because you never know, like 20 years from now, it could be a, it could be a massive thing for them. So that's where I put, I, mean, I don't have it in my own portfolios, but I have it in my kids' portfolios. That's where I buy things like this. 
So NAK has a, has a massive gold deposit up in Alaska, but they're not allowed to drill it, uh, to mine it, because um, there's some salmon, and they're going to kill them all. So people don't want them to kill the salmon, and there's a whole thing. So that's, that's pretty much what it is. But since Trump is dismantling the EPA bit by bit, it's a, it's a high possibility that, they get, that they'll be able to eventually do something. And I don't know. I don't see any particular. Obviously, something happened because we're up thirty percent today. So there's a month, six months. See, that's they're coming back. They were a buck, and now hopefully they're coming back to a buck. Um, the Trump administration. Okay, this is that pebble mine. Regulators move to work. They're undoing. <laughs> yeah. But this this was the bet. This is why we've been buying them, because we thought this was going to happen. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency will resume considering Wednesday whether to withdraw water pollution restrictions that have stalled the project. Uh, da, da, da. Um, so they're reconsidering. That's it. I mean, if they're reconsidering it, they're, they're, it's very likely they're going to go through. So obviously, everybody's freaking out. This is this is probably the world's largest reserve of gold and copper that these guys have, and it's sitting there, and they just can't mine it. But it's there. They own it. They just can't touch it. Um, oh, it, the most significant undeveloped copper and gold resource in the world: six point five billion tons of minerals, four point five billion assumed minerals. The gold alone is estimated to be worth $100 billion, and you can buy NAK, entire company, for $200 million right now. That's, that's, that's why it's a fun stock, okay? They, they could end up being worth, you know, easily $10 billion, $20 billion, if, if all goes well for them. And uh, that, then you're talking about, obviously, 100 times what they are now. So, so, you know, it's, now again, they're going to not be worth that though because they don't have the money to mine it. They're a tiny little crappy company. They own this land that nobody thought was going to get approved. They've been plugging away to get the approval for years and years and years. What they do is they keep selling the option to be a partner with them for a certain period of time to these companies. That pays all their legal bills to keep things going. It's actually been a great strategy. It doesn't make them any money. But it allows them to stay in court, keep pushing the EPA and blah, blah, blah. And they've been waiting for a chance when a friendly politician comes in who doesn't care about the environment and is willing to uh, strip mine Alaska. And thank God Trump is that guy. So finally, they got it. And, and we've been playing NAK for years because I, I just said this. Eventually, you know, it's mo money, money wins over time. This is too much gold to ignore. This project is too rich. Somebody's going to come in there and do it. And if, if NAK gave it up, it would be somebody else. But I'm very excited about this. This is really good. Yeah, it's going to buy my kids their first house. <laughs> it's a good little project. So still you can get into it. It is dangerous, though, because God forbid if they, if they turn them down, that's it. They'll go back to 10 cents. So don't go crazy, but it's a fun deal. If you have a thousand bucks, if you if you're willing to go to, to Atlantic Tito, you know, if you're willing to go to a casino and lose a thousand bucks in a night, this is something you could lose a thousand bucks on because it could easily end up being a hundred thousand dollars. This is a, this this thing could go up considerably from where it is now. You know, re, in reality, they're going to most likely only get half of what it is because they're going to end up having to take on a partner who who is going to put up all the money and in, in exchange for being able to mine their lands. And um, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But this is huge. I mean, this is, you know, it'll take weeks for this to unravel, but this is a huge thing, and it could end up being a, an incredibly lucrative for NAK. So that's a good thing to end on. It's a nice play. You can still get in on it. It still might work. And uh, it's, it's something we've been looking at for, for years, thinking that, that exactly what's happening now will happen. But again, it's only talks. They're only, look, the EPA is looking at it again. But the EPA can approve it, and that's that. And this thing will go forward. And they'll get sued immediately by the environmentalists to stop it again. So it's not going to, there's no smooth, magical thing. But once the EPA swings in your favor, it's going to be hard to stop it. And they'll, what they'll end up doing is they'll compromise most likely with the environmentalists and say, oh, well, we're only going to pollute this much and not that much. You know, that's going to be the outcome in the end. But it's really cool. So thanks for pointing that out, um, 
uh, Terry, that was, that's a, a good one for us. I like that. All right. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out, and we will do it again next week. All right. Have a, have a good day.